is our next speaker, and we'll be talking about the challenges of developing NER for Holocaust and medieval texts. Hey, everyone. Thanks for uh, inviting me to this talk. So I'm going to be talking about today kind of the challenges that I've experienced in developing NER for two very different uh, domains, one for the Holocaust and one for medieval texts. The Holocaust work is coming out of my postdoc at the Smithsonian Institution's Data Science Lab and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And the medieval text portion is coming out of my work for developing NER models for ancient and medieval languages at the CLTK, the uh, Classical Language Toolkit, which is a Python library for working with under-resourced ancient and medieval uh, languages. And so what I'm gonna talk about today are some of the overarching challenges that I've seen across both of these two very disparate uh, domains. And yet consistently, I see these same problems resurface in pieces here and there over other projects I've been working on as I've developed about 10 or 15 different domain specific uh, NER models for various projects. So first, dealing with the, the Holocaust, there are really kind of three different major categories I, I lump these challenges into. One is ethical, another is linguistic, and another is toponyms, which I'll get to all these in, uh, in due course. But first, the ethical concerns. When we think about ethics and we think about uh, machine learning, we oftentimes think about that from a machine learning point of view, right? Introducing biases to models and trying to account for that, et cetera. But with something as delicate as the Holocaust, I'm a historian by training. I kind of approach ethics from both the ML point of view and also a historical, a historian's point of view. And so for me, ethics kind of came in a few different ways. So first of all, when I was developing the NER model for Holocaust texts, I really had to think about the uh, using something like machine learning to do NER. Um, is it ethical, in fact, to do that? And if, if so, how can we go about doing it where it's uh, better for the user experience? And that's what I was trying to think about this whole time, is who is going to be actually using this NER model? And at the end of the day, we decided that it was going to be used by the public at large and also within the Holocaust Museum. And the public at large would be able to use it both via Python and, and downloading it and pip installing it. Uh, but also by the public at large through a Streamlit app, which will be uh, the front end of the NER model. Now, this means that those who could use it would be people who had no background in machine learning whatsoever and no background in coding. And while from a machine learning point of view, we could understand some mistakes such as an individual being extracted and identified not as a person, rather as a concentration camp, which I'll get to in just a second, this might be a little traumatic especially if the person doing the searching was either a victim of the Holocaust or a family member of that victim. And so this, these were some of the things that I had to think about. Also the ethics of is making NER and extracting entities from a text in fact ethical? And if, if so, how do you go about doing that? And so for example, I thought about uh, NER and extracting and identifying uh, differences between personal names, such as victim and perpetrator of violence. But that introduces a whole set of ethical problems, such as false identification, etc. And so these are just some of the larger ethical concerns I was kind of thinking about. And moving on to the linguistic challenges, Holocaust documents present a whole bunch of linguistic challenges. First of all, a lot of the oral testimonies that are at the Holocaust Museum are given by non-native speakers of English, and yet the, the testimonies are in English. This introduces certain peculiarities to the English that uh, a lot of off-the-shelf ML models, such as those at Spacey, even the large model, are gonna have a hard time uh, handling. Another linguistic peculiarity is the, the multilingual nature of these oral testimonies. So oftentimes a, a, a Holocaust speaker or survivors uh, will be speak, giving testimony and they'll switch between English and then to their native mother tongue of Polish or um, Latvian, et cetera, down on, on the list. And so these documents end up being multilingual in nature and well. And a lot of the, up until uh, BERT, a lot of the off the shelf models uh, were gonna be trained on really one specific language. So handling these multilingual documents presented another uh, challenge. And I'll talk about how I overcame some of these at the end if there's time. Another linguistic problem is that a lot of the speakers use dialectical uh, terms for specific entities that most models will never have encountered. And because of the odd syntax around the usage of those entities, uh, the models will not be able to generalize well. And finally, there is another problem with Holocaust documents that was raised in the introduction, which is toponyms, uh, a, a word being used in multiple different ways to mean multiple different things. 
when I was developing this NER, I wanted to be able to extract specifically concentration camps and ghettos because this was obviously of interest to both the museum and general researchers on the Holocaust. And so this issue of toponyms came up really when it came to identifying and extracting ghettos. Warsaw, for example, appears frequently throughout oral testimonies, and yet it's used both as the city general and the ghetto specific. So one of the th challenges was getting the model to recognize uh, when Warsaw, for example, was being used as a city generally and specifically a, a ghetto uh, targeted. And so those are kind of some of the main Holocaust NER challenges that I encountered. And again, I'll talk about some of the solutions kind of at the end. Uh, I want to move over now to some of the uh, NER challenges I found while developing uh, medieval Latin NER models, both for classical Latin and also for medieval Latin, and also really something I encountered with a whole bunch of medieval languages such as Old Norse and uh, Middle High German. The first main thing is that a lot of these medieval and ancient languages are highly inflected. And uh, Kaylin, uh, uh, Kalen, I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, raised up in the previous talk about using an entity ruler to generate rules for uh, for producing a data set. And this can be used to function as a really good entity ruler, a rules-based approach, but it can also be used to automate the generation of a machine learning uh, a training data set. So one of the things that you have to think about when you're dealing with highly inflected languages, languages that have nouns that decline, so all the different forms of a noun or verbs that conjugate, is how do you account for these inflections in a rules-based approach? And this is relatively straightforward. You can create a, a rules-based uh, uh, function that'll just identify the declension of a word and then decline it accordingly. And that helps automate the, the building of a more robust entity ruler that can account for variance while being computationally light and not having to rely on a uh, regex through something like Spacey. Another thing that produced a, a lot of challenges in developing these NERs are two different things that are kind of tied together, and that's textual variance and textual corruption. When I was developing medieval Latin models, I wanted these models to generalize well, not just on the standard structured spelling of words and names, but also on the potential variants. Medieval names, even in formal critical editions, even in the same uh, publisher, will oftentimes have varied spellings for the same name. This occurs even more frequently when we look at these names and the manuscripts in which they were originally written. And this leads to the other point, textual corruption. So oftentimes uh, the first stage in producing a critical edition will be going through and transcribing all of the manuscripts and then collating them and standardizing them. Now, these textual corruptions, I, I wanted these NER models to be able to generalize well, even with uh, odd punctuations in the middle of words and maybe even textual corruption in the sense of poor OCR if somebody was using Tesseract to extract text from scans of medieval texts. And so these were some of the, the big picture challenges that I encountered uh, with medieval Latin. But I want to spend the last little bit kind of talking about specifically the way in which I overcame some of the challenges with the Holocaust NER model. And if there's interest in me going over the medieval Latin or medieval languages, I'd be more than happy to answer it in the, the Q&A and the comments section, but I don't think I have enough time to do both. So how did I address the issues with um, and all the different issues that I encountered with or challenges I encountered with the Holocaust NER? Well, the Holocaust NER presented a, a bunch of challenges that couldn't be accounted by um, developing kind of standard practices, uh, data augmentation to uh, generate a more robust training data or things of that nature. Instead, I had to take into account a lot of different things in the actual architecture of the NER model. And this is how I found, uh, this is the way I found to resolve a lot of these kind of ethical issues uh, really early on in the pipeline. So if you look at an NER pipeline, typically you'll have just one, and if you're using Spacey, you'll have just one NER model that runs it, it'll classify, I think the standard large model classifies something like 18 entities. Um, and that's just a single model running. Uh, when I try to train a whole bunch of these custom domain specific entities into a model, I found that no matter how hard I tried, I would still end up occasionally with uh, certain individuals being labeled as a camp or as a ghetto. And it was my uh, concern that a user of this model might be kind of turned off from using it or be uh, in, in worst case scenario traumatized by seeing their name or a family member's name labeled as something that was the, the place of violence for them in their, uh, in their respective lives. So what I decided to do was introduce a series of cascading models and a spacing model, which function as individual pipes. And these pipes can be both uh, moved around and um, controlled with different functions. 
So generally, this is how the pipeline works. The very first thing that is labeled is camp. And I worked really hard to get this model. Um, uh, sorry, it's camp and ghetto, the first model. Uh, so this model that's first in the pipeline is a model that's trained to identify both concentration camps and ghettos and extract them. And I found that by putting this model early on, I could allow for a user to either pursue an ML option, so use the machine learning model, or use an entity ruler. The entity ruler prevents any possibility of a person or anything else being labeled as a camp or ghetto. So it can be used for users who aren't comfortable with machine learning in that sense. However, users who do want to use a machine learning model that will generalize better on textual corruption and unencountered concentration camps can use the machine learning model. And when you're thinking about a pipeline for NER, it's important to think about uh, as the text goes through and is marked up, those entities that are marked up cannot be overwritten unless you give them permission to be overwritten. And so that's why it's important to view this as a consistent pipeline all the way down. Uh, the next models were things like uh, events. So things like Kristallnacht being able to be identified successfully. I found that uh, events around World War II were not successfully identified by off-the-shelf spacey models. So I trained a model to identify events more broadly. And another thing that I found are those dialectical peculiarities where little tiny small towns in Poland whose names aren't still used the way that these speakers reference, I trained a model to actually be able to identify and encounter uh, all Eastern European uh, cities and small little towns. And then moving on down the list, I wanted to also make sure that uh, a user could kind of customize and tweak a particular kind of entity that is challenging, and that is person. I, 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 being able to extract people uh, that are, appear in Holocaust documents was particularly challenging because a lot of the names are not names that, pre, uh, that stronger, robust models have encountered. And like I said, the syntax of these documents would throw off the models from generalizing. So I have different models that I've been training to actually encounter, uh, to extract uh, names that are uh, Eastern European and Slavic in origin, which has a marked improvement. In addition to that, I've developed, uh, I've instead of doing transfer learning and doing uh, risking catastrophic loss, I brought back into the fold the spacey small model and used it to just simply extract dates, GPEs, and NORPs. This prevented me from having to come up with a regex solution or a rules-based solution to extract dates. And then by using a custom factory after that pipe, I was able to eliminate all other tags in the spacey model. And what ends up happening here at the end of the pipeline is that you use what the spacey model is very good at doing, such as dates, GPEs, and uh, uh, national or religious political entities, and use custom models for doing both domain specific things like concentration camps and ghettos, and also uh, models that are more custom trained to extract uh, specific domain uh, locational entities. Um, so I know I kind of went through all that very, very quickly, but hopefully that gives you a sense of some of the big overarching challenges that you might encounter when developing custom domain specific NER models, and some of the ways that you might both in architecture and in rules uh, address those challenges and head on. Thank you.